Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. And now, here are Bob and Richard. Good afternoon. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. I'm Bob Dancer. And I'm Richard Munchkin. Today, our guest is a woman who calls herself Sia Leita. Uh, she is a poker, female poker player. She's written a book. We're going to talk about her book. She also has announced her intention to play in this year's World Series of Poker disguised as a man and gotten some pushback on that. So we're going to talk about that subject as well. So see you later. Welcome to Gambling with an Edge. Thank you. So nice to be here um, and happy to be sharing news about the book. Um, It's called Black Widow Poker. And the reason it's called Black Widow Poker is because I earned the name nickname Black Widow uh, because I learned that playing with men, the only way I could get an advantage was to limp in with huge hands rather than raising because men did not like it when they were raised by a woman. And that's what led to the whole idea of trying to play poker um, on a level playing field while dressed as a man and disguised as a man to see if that increased my winning. In fact, it did. I win about four to five times more often and more tournament uh, when I'm dressed as a man than I do as a woman. Now that's counterintuitive to me because I, I have always thought that you have an advantage being a woman because men play badly against women. So why, why, why do you do better than if they think you're a man? Well, there's a lot of, that's a loaded question. There are a lot of socio-sexual uh, cultural things that come into play when a woman sits down at a table. Um, first and foremost, I've noticed when I sit down at, at the table as a woman, there's immediately uh, a little bit of more chatter at the table. Men might want to ask me some questions or they may, you know, definitely take notice that I'm sitting down. Um, some men will sort of almost audition by being clever and, talking a lot more to sound cool or whatever. And um, as I sat down as a man, one thing I was really shocked by was the complete silence and lack of uh, lack of um, acknowledgement of me at the table. So right off the bat, yeah, there's possibly some effect women have on men when they sit down. But as soon as the real betting starts and the real tournaments start, men are, it seems almost programmed to want to make sure that they don't look like they aren't alpha Um, When a woman comes into the pot, Uh, no matter what they're holding, it just seems like, gosh, you know, if a woman raises them, oh, my gosh, they're going to show them who's boss and they're going to re-raise or just make it very difficult for a woman to play poker like a man plays poker. So I found it a lot more profitable to limp in with ace queen, for instance, and um, let the boys do the pushing and then sort of in an Aikido move, which is to take their energy and redirect it in my favor start to um, let them do the betting for me and to pull them in. And that's where the, the name Black Widow Poker came from. Right. So, so it seems to me that if the men are playing against you as a woman, when you're playing as a woman, if they're playing too aggressive, aggressively uh, because of that, well, then you can basically just sit back and play the nuts, right? And you're going to get paid off when you when you have the nuts so I, I i still don't understand why you do better when you're as a man because it would seem to me they're they're playing better if against you if, the, if when you're dressed as a man um okay. well right? i mean example yeah go sure ahead. no no uh, okay, you go. okay uh yeah an example is i mean and any poker you know, book that you read will tell you that if you sit around and wait for the nuts to win a tournament, you're just, you're going to go home. You're going to hit the parking lot because that's just not going to happen. You have to be able to massage the hands, uh, play the board, uh, read other players, um, intimidate people out of pots, protect your hands with big bets. And those are just things women cannot do. So waiting around for the nuts, great. That works great. But let's say I'm dealt pocket aces, an excellent hand by any standard. But as we all know, all of the people playing poker know, we have to protect those aces. If we let every single person at the table, eight or nine other players come in and play those aces with us against the flop, we have a very, very slim chance of actually winning by the time we get to showdown. We have to protect our aces by making a big raise and hopefully going either heads up or just against one or two players. 
Now, what happens when a woman raises with aces? Call, 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 call. It's just like guys just don't respect the raise. They don't think it's serious. They think they can outplay you once the cards come out. They think they can bully you off of a hand. Now, if those aces stand up, it's going to be a monster. You're going to win this huge pot. But the, the, the actual ability to protect your hand or to use a big bet, to push people up out, to, pr to protect against the flush draw, those are things that are harder for a woman to do. Okay. Yeah, actually, now, now it's making sense to me because – uh, it, it's because it's a tournament situation. So in a cash Always game, turn. yeah, yeah, yeah. So in a cash game, you would make more money as a woman than you would as playing as a man. Well, Am I uh, correct? I, I don't think that's necessarily true. I think there's some assumptions made that, you know, just waiting around for the nuts is, you know, a winning um, strategy. It's not necessarily always true. But, I mean, I would say – because my primary experience is with tournaments and the book is about tournaments, that that's really what my main experience has been in. And uh, that's what the book's mostly directed at talking about tournament play. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It and might be slightly different you, in cash. Yeah. Yeah. Um, when did you um, first try this out, try this uh, out, the uh, playing as a man? Uh, well, I, the first time I tried it out, um, believe it or not, was on online poker. And because online we can choose whatever avatar we want, we can choose our name. And that's when I really got the sense that your gender made a big difference in how you were respected at the table. When I played as a woman, as soon as I sat down to a tournament, I'd get somebody sending me a little flower icon or they'd send me a donkey icon. <laughs> it was either you're stupid or you're a lover. And it was just like, okay. But as a man, I just sort of blended in. And, and, and once I realized that I was winning so much more often as a, as a man online, I decided, wow, well, how can I possibly do this in person? And could I pull it off? And fortunately, I was able to. And that's, that's how um, we've gotten this far. And now we're looking at the World Series as poker is sort of the, the, grand, you know, the grand competition that we're hoping we can do. Um, there's a little conflict by the officials there saying that they do not want to see a woman in a beard and they, they will make sure to look for her and kick her out. But we're hoping that's not going to be the case. We're working on it. Well, I mean, the other problem with the World Series is they, you're required to have a, a Harris players, or a Caesars players card and show ID and everything when you, when you sign up. So they're going to know from your ID that you're a woman, right? Well, first, I do play with an ID at all tournaments, um, but I usually have the name shortened so that it's a little bit more, um, um, what do you call it, asexual, I guess. Um, ah, yes, and, good idea. Androgynous, <laughs> yeah, androgynous. And, um, and the other thing is, is that even if I do play, let's just say I played with my full real name at the poker table, once I sit down, that name's really not going to be mentioned until you get to the final. If, if it's televised, you're going to have some issues. And as you get to the final table, that name's going to come up. But um, in terms of just regular tournament play, nobody's really discussing names and they're just going by appearance. And so that's, that's worked out fine so far. And well, they can you televise talk? a lot earlier than the final table. So the, uh, they, there are featured tables quite a bit earlier than the final table. So even before the, uh, the bubble, they will be televising several of the tables. And if you are in any hand that's televised, presumably they're going to want your name quite sure. a bit before the bubble. Right. And so that's not going to be something that we're going to worry about too much. We're definitely going to use the shortened version of the name, but we're definitely going to go with the real name. Right. Yeah. If you have an, uh, a, a name that could be either one, like Gene or um, Joe or, uh, you know, yeah, I mean, I, I can see where that would work. Uh, yeah. It happens to be a name like that, fortunately. Right. Yeah. Chris. Yeah. Um, and and can you talk a little bit about um, what it was like when you first, you know, dressed as a man? I mean, just uh, like 
I, I, I know you don't want to get too specific to out yourself, but what did this get up involve? <laughs> well, um, I went to a uh, professional makeup artist at a place called Cinema Secrets in Los Angeles. And I know had it well. Her, okay. And had her, um, her name was actually James, um, which is so strange to have a female named James putting on your transgender makeup. But um, so she did uh, the makeup and, um, and helped me understand how I could apply it myself because in traveling from tournament to tournament, I wasn't going to be able to have a makeup artist on hand all the time. So um, it was really interesting. You know, the transition, first I thought it would be easy to fake. I thought even though my features were pretty fine, that I would be able to either pass as an Asian guy, you know, I hate to say that, but, you know, they don't have big pores, they don't have a lot of hair on their face, or maybe I could be like kind of metrosexual. Not the case. My face was so feminine that it took quite a bit to make it look masculine. And um, so she fixed me up that way, and I went to a Goodwill because I wanted to have some of the male juju on my clothes. <laughs> So I went to a Goodwill to get like some real male clothes that had actually been worn by guys and um, big baggy stuff. Um, you know, obviously the biggest problem was strapping down my chest area, uh, which I thought would not be a big problem, but actually playing that way, it makes it very difficult because you, you're breathing shallow and that, and, and as you know, tournaments can go on for eight or nine hours and that really gets tiring. Plus, I had, like, something to make my stomach come out because no matter how much I strapped my chest down, it was still showing up. And so I had to extend my stomach out. And then, of course, I had to pack my pants, which I actually really enjoyed. And <laughs> then I, <laughs> and then I um, had to learn how to walk. And that was difficult. Um, it took me a while to, to get a walk down. I have a very feminine walk. I tend to walk with my head held high, almost like kind of like a ballerina. And I, um, I found that if I turned my toes outward and kind of walked like a duck, that I automatically started looking like a dude. So that really helped with my walk. I knew that poker was a very solitary sport and that I could get away with not speaking much. And so I didn't think that would be a huge problem. I keep my conversation to a minimum. I don't engage. It's just too easy to tell. And uh, playing the first time as a woman, boy, it was pretty tricky. Um, you know, just walking to the casino, I remember thinking the first time. I, I just couldn't believe I was actually doing it. I could not believe it. And the security guard started walking towards me, and he sort of just looked at me and goes, what's up? And I thought, oh, my God, he thinks I'm a dude. <laughs> I've never had a guy say, what's up, to me before. They always say, hi, how you doing, or something like that. He said, what's up, bro, like, you know, like I was a bro. So I um, I thought there was a chance. I went and bought my ticket. The guy at the ticket desk who had served me hundreds of times did not recognize me. I sat at the table with players I knew. They didn't recognize me. I felt like I was in a glass, behind a glass you know, wall, looking out like through a window out of my body. I was a female inside, but outside I was a male. And it was really interesting to watch the reactions, which were immediately different to uh, playing. At first I played the way I regularly play, which is a Black Widow style, limping in with big hands, trapping, stuff like that. But then I started thinking, well, let me try now to play like you're supposed to play. And that really went well. And so I ended up doing much better in tournaments. Um, there didn't seem to be a target on me. And so uh, I've decided I really want to try it at the biggest um, competition of the year, which is the World Series of Poker main event in Las Vegas this, this July. Yeah, I, you know, I have a, a friend who was a um, blackjack player, a card counter, who got very notorious around Las Vegas, and she also uh, dressed up like a man and said the same thing, that the, the biggest problem was learning how to walk. Um, and, and so she went through, yeah, exactly what she went through. Uh, but uh, un unfortunately, it didn't work well for her. They did recognize her anyway after, after a short period of time. But what about um, your hands? Do you, ha do you worry about, you know, because women definitely have different hands than men, and at the poker table, your hands are right out there on display as you throw your chips in. 
Sure, and hands are a big deal. Um, I I really did my best to actually model the body language of the men around me. So little things like, you know, as a woman, I would put my cards down and slide them over towards the dealer kind of gently. But as a man, you know, you do like a backward spin flip of your card. You just like toss them, like take those, you know. And um, and then when I wasn't in the hand or, or sitting at the table, I would always keep my hands tucked into my big hoodie jacket or I'd have them uh, knuckles turned towards my mouth and have, you know, covering my beard a little bit, um, just trying to buy as much time as I could to make that beard look uh, reasonable because on close inspection, you know, it's, it's tricky. It's very, very difficult to fake gender. Uh, How long? Actually, that, I, I just have one other quick disguise story, Bob. Another friend of mine uh, who was a blackjack player with a lot of heat in Las Vegas went out and got a fake beard and wig and all that and was sitting playing and a boss walked by and did a 180 and said, is that a fake beard? And he went, yeah, it is. And the boss goes, yeah, I thought so, and just turned around and kept walking <laughs> let him play. Um, so That's what I'd like to I'd happen like to at know. the WSOP. That would be perfect. Yeah. I'd like to know how long it took you to learn to pee standing up. <laughs> <laughs> Fortunately, yeah. men's bathrooms uh, don't have, um, you know, they do have stalls. And, and fortunately, yes, I travel – I travel from our uh, from poker tournament to poker tournament in a motorhome, fully equipped. So I'm fortunate that I have like a basically a huge house that I can go to privately, and um, and use it that way. You know, one of the things we should mention is that um, one of the reasons that the World Series instituted this rule was uh, Phil Lack showed up one year dressed as an old man, and. Right. To me, that's a completely different situation. He was trying to disguise who he was. I mean, not players not thinking he was Phil Lack, as opposed to trying to disguise gender. So um, I think they should let you play. Yeah, and also, you know, there's a lot of questions that come into play um, regarding this. For instance, if the, the whole premise behind the, the, the ruling – are the rule is to make sure that somebody does not change their appearance um, during the tournament or come in as somebody else. There's a lot of things here that have to be questioned. Number one, first of all, if you've never seen me play at the WSOP, um, if you've never uh, known me as a recognizable person, then why couldn't I start and play and finish? looking the same every single day. Number two, let's say a man comes in and he doesn't have a beard, but he makes it to day four. Well, when he has that five o'clock shadow or that heavier beard that's coming in on day four, has he changed his appearance? Or what if a man has a beard? It's, why is he allowed to have a beard and cover up some of his facial um, tells where a woman is not allowed to cover her face? Or what if he starts it with a beard and then decides to shave it halfway through? Will he be disqualified? Can he wear a toupee? What about transgender people? I mean, there's really a lot of questions about this ruling. You know, where do you draw the line? If I were to work, wear very heavy makeup the first day and go in as a vixen, and then the next day go in as Rachel Maddow, would that count? You know, and Rachel Maddow being kind of a more butchy sort of lesbian-looking woman, um, studious, and, and maybe compare that to like a, a Marilyn Monroe type character. Is that allowed, or would I be changing my identity too much then? It's just a vague rule. Yeah, I agree. So we started a GoFundMe page. Okay. Um, we had, yeah, we, we had someone, uh, sorry. We had someone start a GoFundMe page to assist in the legal defense, and I have an appointment actually this Friday. Yeah, with, um, a legal, with legal counsel to just look it over and see what the options are. We don't want to mess up the game, but honestly, when you find out you can play poker, and win five times more often by simple disguise, uh, just by changing your gender. It, that's the profit thing that you want. I mean, that's just money you want to take. And it's frustrating to play as a woman and to, you know, have a bit of a target on your chest. Very good. Um, we're talk. We're talk. Uh, see you later. See you later does sound like a, a sassy kind of a name. Uh, how did you happen to pick it? 
Just well, it's it's funny because I had someone call me and said, you know, if you need an editor, I'll go by Alligator. Yeah. <laughs> <I'm> like, okay, <laughs> Alligator. Um, uh, the reason that um, See You Later came up, there's a um, a musician and and songwriter who has become very very popular and has many gold records and is enormously successful who has never revealed her face to the public in fact she'll wear either a wig that covers her whole face or she'll send somebody else in her place to accept a re- uh, an award and and that person will claim to be her because she really wanted to mess with this whole idea of becoming a celebrity she didn't want any a part of it and her name is Sia and if you have listened to popular music you certainly heard um, Sia's music on Top 40 Radio. So Sia is where the original first name came out. And Leto was kind of a plan word, obviously, because um, definitely these guys didn't know that they were going to be seeing me at the table when I'm there. Now, your book, though, seems to be uh, kind of about the opposite um, for women, right? It, it seems to be more about how to take advantage of being a woman at the poker table. Do I have that right? Yeah, definitely. Um, It takes, for those women that do not want to dress as a man, obviously, it does take that perspective where, okay, you're sitting down to the table. There's 65 men in the tournament. You are one of two women. How are you going to play given all the gender things that gender bias that goes on at the table? How can you play this hand? How can you play that hand to get the benefit? For example, with men, if, um, if let's say I'm holding ace queen and I've limped in uh, and they've raised, so I've called their raise. Now we're both going into a flop, the two of us, man against woman. And the flop comes out ace, two, five. Well, I've hit my top pair. Awesome. The way that I'm going to get the most money out of this is to make a little bet, a little bet towards the flop. Oh, you know, I just want to make a little bet. This is what for some reason pushes the guy's button. And that's when he's going to push. He's going to be like, oh, I thought you were weak, but now I know you're weak, and I'm going to just beat this down. And that's when they'll push a bunch of chips in, and your ace, of course, will probably end up being good. And it's so much better than if you were to, you know, um, bet like a normal person would or even even check. Um, I think betting a little bit for some reason inspires a man to want to just clobber you. (laughs) (laughs) That definitely is um, a big part of the book, is using those those different um, scenarios that are at the table that women encounter to make the best, to get, get the best of guys. And like I said, Aikido and taking their energy and using it for your own benefit, those kind of um, strategies are, are what we do best. The, the book also um, uh, will show Sia playing as a completely sexed up, vamped up vixen. Like, you'll see that example too. How did the men react to that? Um, compared to how they reacted as a man. So we see Sia play as um, basically four different characters. Herself, um, more of a, you know who Rachel Maddow is? Yeah, sure. Yes. Okay. So a Rachel Maddow, kind of um, almost like androgynous type of woman. Um, a vixen, gorgeous bombshell of a woman with all the bells and whistles. And as a completely masculine guy, or as masculine as I could be. So um, you get to see all those different experiences, and but main, the main focus is on man versus woman. And when you when you say see, do you mean there are photographs in the book? No, uh, but we get to read about you know we get to, to uh, see as far as the hands are to, um, kind of explained and how things turned out. We get to read about uh, the experience. I see, I see. Okay. And and so you you actually have experimented with all of these different looks at different times just to see how it would affect the way people played against you? Yeah. I mean, originally it was just going to be myself and then myself as a man. But then I had a lot of people respond and say, you know, I'd love to know how you did if you were really, really dressed up. Like Jennifer Tilly is really good at that. She shows up at the table and it's just like, wow. And, um, you know, I wanted to see, too, you know, you can actually use that against the, the other gender as well. Um, that actually does work as a weapon in some ways. Guys get flustered. Um, they get, uh, it, it, you know, when sex is on the brain instead of poker, uh, that is definitely a disadvantage. 
And men work so differently from women. And we go into this in the book a lot. You know, the way men think about sex compared to the way women think about sex. And it's just worlds apart. I'd love to give you an example. Would that be okay? Sure. Yeah. Okay. Um, There's a show called Family Feud. It's kind of an old, I think it might still be on, but it was um, hosted by Steve Harvey. And Steve Harvey... Yeah, and basically you have two teams of five, and they come up and they try to give the top answer to a certain question, and whoever gets the most answers right wins all the money. Well, the question was, okay, from a man's perspective, fill out the rest of this sentence. I, and this was from a married man's perspective. Fill out the rest of this sentence. Fill in the blank. I would blank for sex. So, of course, there were men and women on both sides and the men you know the first answer is i would pay for sex and uh, you know um survey says Bing, you got it that was one i would pay for sex the next answer goes to the woman okay answer this question as a married man i would blank for sex she goes i would cook for sex <laughs> And, of course, it's like, there's no no cook for sex. That was not what a married man be willing to do. Next man comes up, I would lie for sex. Bing! Goes, and then the woman, another woman comes along, I would clean for sex. And she's thinking like a woman. And the point is, is that their answers, their top five answers were, and let me try to remember this, I would, I would pay for sex, I would lie for sex, I would kill for sex, and I would die for sex. So it was shocking. You know, that is really different. And so when you sit down to the table looking like an absolute bombshell, that certainly has an effect. And um, it's kind of interesting to see how that plays out, too. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. This would make a good good, uh, television reality show. Now, the, yeah. the book's coming out. The book is not out yet. It's going to be out in approximately a month. Is that is that what you say? Right, April 19th. Okay. It'll, it'll be on Amazon. It's called Black Widow Poker. If the, um, the World Series of Poker has not relaxed its antipathy to having you compete as a man, will the pictures in the book – make it easier for them to identify you? Well, there aren't any pictures in the book, but I will be identified at the series, hopefully once I cash or if I make it and and go deep. So there will be pictures after the book is released and after the World Series of Poker, and there's actually even a TV show that's interested in been talking to us. So there is going to be an, an exposure you know, eventually, but we want to make sure that there is really no hint whatsoever. It's so easy to, I mean, just the fact that it got out that we're, you know, doing this and I'm playing as a man at the WSOP has obviously caused a lot of ripples. And so originally that was going to be on the down low a little bit, but Hey, that's okay. We'll go with the, go with the story. Um, But yeah, we'd like to keep all photos and all indications of identity um, secret until after the competition. There, on the other, on the uh, some people might be interested to know if they go to the website to order the book and pre-order it, they get an autographed photo of Sia as a man and a woman, and and the book as well. So that's something. If somebody really wants to have a photo of it, they can do that. But otherwise, um, we'll be just standing up at the World Series to reveal. And so and are you planning to? to... Go ahead, Bob. Go ahead. Well, I was just saying, you, you sounds like you just talked Seth Polanski into ordering a book online so we can get the pictures. But well, the picture won't wouldn't wouldn't come out. They wouldn't get the autographed picture till after the WSOP. But that's a good point. Well, there goes that order. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, and we may be overestimating how interested Seth Polanski is in all this, Bob. But uh, but the, but the other. Um, I, are you only planning to play in the main event, or are you going to play in more than one event? Yeah, probably some satellites. So I'll be out there for the entire month. So I'll definitely be playing in some satellites as well. I don't expect those to draw too much attention. Um, so there will be a lot of tournaments going on that all through June and July. So I'll definitely be out there. And we'll be doing promotions for the book as well. 
Okay, so, and you said that uh, if you go to the website to, to uh, buy the book, what is the website? So imagine Black Widow Poker, but separated by dashes. So it would be black-widow-poker.com. So black-widow-poker.com. Okay, we'll, we'll be sure to put that in the show notes uh, as well. Thank you so much. So, yeah, it's, it's been an interesting journey, and it's been – I think the most surprising thing out of, of, of it all is, is the extraordinary interest in it. I mean, it's just insane. I've been doing interview after interview after interview, and I'm so grateful for that. But it's just extraordinary, the interest. I mean, people do, maybe it's the Me Too and the Time's Up thing, but people have this a little bit on the brain, and they're intrigued. And, they're, you know, it is a question in our minds, if we're poker players, why hasn't a woman won one single WSOP main event bracelet in almost 50 years? It just seems impossible that that could be the case. And why aren't more women playing poker? You know, what, are they, what, what, what is missing here? The cards are not heavy. It's not like it's too difficult for us to understand or lift the cards or make a bet. But something else is going on, and that's really what the book explores. What is going on there that is creating this lopsided um, situation in the world of poker? How many, do you know how many women uh, on average enter the World Series? And yeah, the main event? I think, sure. I think, I, I'm going to guess here, but I remember reading that it's less than 300 out of the maybe six or seven or 8,000 that go in. Definitely less than 5%. So um, last I read was there were 250 or so women in the last, last time I, I looked at that stat. So it's very, very small amount. But, I mean, really, there's only been one woman that's even made it to a final table, and that was in 1995. That's just crazy. Well, a couple of years ago, two came really close, blowing out yeah. 10th and 11th place. So, all right, we're going to take a brief commercial break. We come back. We're going to be talking some more to see you later get a kick out of that name, I apologize, or maybe that's good. <laughs> the South Point has more than 10,000 games, returning more than 99%. This is more than anyone else has. Throughout March, the monthly promotion is geared towards players who are already receiving a mailer. Instead of picking up your usual free play from Tuesday through Thursday, now you pick up normal free play Monday through Wednesday, and if you do, you get the same amount of free play on Friday or Saturday. If you pick up during all eight periods in March, you receive twice the amount of your regular free play on Monday, April 2nd. At videopoker.com, it's the best place to play lots of games. If you sign up for the gold membership, $8.95 a month or $79.95 a year, this allows you to get correction on most of the game. The game of the week is called Super Draw 6 card poker. This is a 10 coins per line hand. It's played in normal fashion except you get one additional card after the draw. So if, for example, you were dealt a pair of kings and a pair of fours and a seven, in most games you hold the two pairs. And then instead of getting one additional card, now you get two and you'll get paid for two pair. You'll get paid for full houses when they came, come. There's also a category called three pair. There's also going to be a category of two three of a kind. Additional pay schedule categories that you find in this game and not elsewhere are six card straights, uh, six card flushes, four of a kind with a pair, six card straight flushes, and a six-card royal flush, which would go from the ace to the nine of the same suit. Uh, these are pay schedule categories not found on normal video poker software. So if you wish to analyze the game, you're going to need to create your own software or know somebody who has. We are back with See You Later. See You Later. Uh, female poker player 
her book coming out April 19th is Black Widow Poker. She is strongly considering competing in the, this year's World Series of Poker main event dressed as a, a male. The World Series of Poker may or may not try to stop her. Um, Actually, you know, I, I just wanted I just wanted to say one other thing. Uh, go ahead. I mean, what if you're transgender and you come dressed as a man? I mean, they they can't throw you out for that. I mean, that's a lawsuit waiting to happen. So I don't see how they could get away with not letting you not letting you uh, do this. But I don't know. Yeah. We'll, see. <laughs> we'll see how it how it plays out. Well, we asked us those questions and the questions about, you know, different attire that men are allowed to wear. And um, our answer from the WSOP and, and specifically from that gentleman that commented on the original article, Mr. Polanski, was, uh, no, I'm sorry, I'm not going to answer those questions. We have se- he said, we have several checkpoints throughout the event and compliance requirements. And we can just tell you that the odds are likely we will catch you and catch you early and be forced to act. So those are his words in the email, and it is a question. They, they, he also mentions this is a on private property, and I'm not sure that that really protects him for discrimination if, if it's deemed to be a you know, mild form of that. And it's not that we want the fight. We just want the, you know, I'd like the ability to play with a little better chance of winning. Sure. And if somebody says this is a good cause and they want to contribute to your GoFundMe page or GoFundMe to, for your legal advice on this, how do they do that? Well, if they go to GoFundMe.com forward slash Black Widow Poker Legal Fund, um, or if they, just, if they just search GoFundMe and Black Widow, they'll probably um, find the site pretty easily. Um, and we're really, really grateful for take you know a radio host like yourself taking the time to speak with us and then but mostly we just want to have fun the object is of the game is to have fun and i'm really looking forward to hearing them say shuffle up and deal at the wsop well good luck to you and um however it goes uh come back on the air afterwards and uh talk to us briefly even if it's not for a full hour that would be good thank you all right, so now we have some email uh, sent to us at gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com. And the first email comes from a video poker player who, when playing triple-double bonus, can't bring himself to hold a kicker to three aces. He wants to know if this is a big deal. The short answer is, yep, very big deal. The primary hand we're talking about is something like Ace, 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 four, five. Playing where full houses pay nine for one, for dollar single line players, the value of the hold ace, 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 four, rather than ace, 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 is about $18.81 greater on for a total of $5 bet. This is huge. Video poker players make differences where the difference is less than a penny. This one's $18.81. There are two other holds there could be, such as ace, 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 two, three, which is different because both of the small cards are kickers, or even ace, 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 two, two, which is a dealt full house. Um, They're not holding the ace, 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 two. The air would be worth more than $20. More to the point, this is not a question you should be sending to Richard and me. Using video poker software is a critical part of the learning process. Yes, I sell and use video poker for winners, but there are other ones as well, including the free Wizard of Odds video poker hand analyzer. The question you said it is definitely one where inquiring minds want to know, but it's also one where uh, you should be using tools to answer yourself. It can be months before we get to your question on the air, if we ever do, and there are quite a few variations of it. So learn to do it yourself. A few weeks ago. Yeah, actually, I just just want to add, uh, you know, I think anybody who gets emails regularly 
the thing that pisses off pisses most of us off is when you ask a question, you could just Google. <laughs> you know, <laughs> Google. You have it right there at your fingertips. Learn to use it. Yeah, well, Googling and using video poker software are not quite the same thing. But no, I, I'm saying it's even worse when it's a question they could just a answer by using Google. Yeah, that would be true. This would not be one of those. Yeah. A few weeks ago, um, I learned that Paul McGreal had passed away. Uh, Richard, who was Paul McGreal? Well, Paul McGrill was known as X-22. He was the best backgammon player probably uh, for the last, certainly the last 40 years, maybe the, maybe the last 50. Um, he wrote the best book about backgammon, which is just called Backgammon. It was, uh, he was a columnist. He had, he had a backgammon column in the New York Times uh, for several years. And then he switched to poker at one point. A lot of people may know him from seeing him on television playing poker uh, and his quacking. He would uh, quack a lot, especially when he had two ducks. Um, and, you know, I, I first met Paul in 1975, one of my first major backgammon tournaments. And at that time, he was known as the computer. And he would wear mirrored sunglasses and use these herky-jerky movements to intimidate his opponents. And he was very intimidating, actually. Um, but uh, so he will be missed. He was a brilliant guy, and, and, uh, and he will be missed. Yeah, I think he was definitely a big influence on my backgammon career. I met him a few years after Richard did, although not many, at a uh, United States um, backgammon championship in the late 70s. Uh, it was held in Reno. Uh, it's then the, the casino was called MGM. Today, the same building is called Grand Sierra Resorts, I think. And he was a uh, a bigger than life character. He um, up he would play, make wild moves. Uh, he was actually a very good loser, uh, even though he was more brilliant than the rest of his opponents. He was not always a winning player in Chouettes because he would take uh, in backgammon. There's a double process where if I doubled Richard, then Richard would have the choice of playing for double the stakes or give me single mistakes, give me single stakes, and the game would be over. And Paul had a, such confidence in his own abilities that he was known to take doubles where mathematically it was clearly a pass. So um, even though he very likely was the best backgammon player in the world. In Chouettes, he was not really so formidable. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, he was a bad gambler, but a, a great player. All right. Um, another question from a listener. He says, I've been playing blackjack for a while now, and things have been going well. I want to transition to video poker to expand his arsenal been finding this difficult because of the very many games on a video poker machine to play. I learned 9-6 jacks are better on training software and had the software set to correct my mistakes. I took a break from learning VP, and when I went to my local casino, I realized all their games were 8-5 jacks are better, um, even though I didn't scout the other, area, the other casinos in my area. If I learn video poker, will I ever find 9-6 jacks are better? Will the casino make the mistake accompany me too much? Uh, will I have to learn every game in video poker for success, and what kind of bankroll do I need? All right, there's lots of questions here. The first overall question that you didn't really ask is that, yes, there are, um, those, there are several of us who make a nice living playing video poker. So it's definitely still possible. A lot fewer people percentage-wise can do it today than could do it five or 10 years ago, 
or 20 years ago, the edges that exist out there in video poker, generally speaking, are smaller than they were. The primary way in which good players make it now is by taking advantage of casino mistakes. Casinos do not make these on purpose, of course, probably by definition, but they continue to make them, and that's basically the way we survive. Now, on the more specific questions, nine, six jacks are better. Yeah, there are lots of casinos that have that, but not all of them, or even not most. The, the website, vpfree2.com, where two is a digit, not spelled out, lists the best video poker games in basically all the casinos in the country. So you will find lots and lots and lots of casinos that offer nine, six jacks or better in various denominations. Whether those are the casinos close to you or not, well, I don't know where you live. Um, nine, six jacks or better it has a house has a half percent casino edge off the top. So you need more than that. There's slot clubs, there's promotions, there's mailers, there's a lot of different things as part of the equation as to how you make it work from there. And a lot of those things are discussed in my book, Video Poker for the Intelligent Beginner. There, I have a weekly blog that you can find on the gamblingwithanedge.com website. A lot of these talk about doing well, um, taking advantage of casino mistakes. The bankroll calculation, there's two main sources for bankroll information in uh, video poker. One is the Video Poker for Winners software, which uh, I'm associated with. It works very well. The other is sold by a man named Dunbar, and it's called a Risk Analyzer for Video Poker. The two systems use very different methods to calculate bankroll. Uh, the Dunbar system uses macros to grind everything out. Uh, Video Poker for Winner has a lot of tables loaded in there, and it does it that way. On questions that they both answer, the amount of bankroll you need for a given situation is very, very close, which indicates that they, um, they both, um, if they agree on what the right answer is, that that's probably right, and they're both quality software. All right. Um, do you have any comment on that, Richard? No. Nope. Okay. So that does it for our live video poker questions, our, our live questions to gamblingwithanedge at gmail.com. Keep them coming. We will attempt to answer them as we can. Uh, we thank our guest, see you later, for her help today. Uh, thank you, Richard. Go out and hit a royal flush, everybody. Good day. <laughs>